Thanks very much, Francois. So, um, as Francois has pointed out, I'm normally based in, in Kenya, which is um, the Kenya Medical Research Institute Wellcome Trust research program that's based on the coast of Kenya in Kilifi. But I'm really enjoying the opportunity to spend some more time in the department here at the moment. Um, so I'm making the presentation today on behalf of a group of people who've been involved in this research. So that was just the first thing that I wanted to say. So what I'm hoping to do over the next 35 to 40 minutes is to just give you a tiny bit of background on the context that I work in so that you can understand um, the origins of this data. Talk a little bit about the background to the area of public health research data sharing, challenges and benefits that are there in the literature. And then to talk you through findings from a study that we conducted recently in Kenya, which was actually part of an international collaborative programme involving a number of other sites. So talk you through that, what we found, and what that seems to have as implications for policy in our setting, and a few concluding comments. I'm very interested to hear if anybody has any reflections on, on what I have to say. So let's just start by orienting you towards, um, towards Kenya. And Kilifi is on the coast of Kenya. Here are some pictures of the research program itself. As I say, Kemri is Kenya Medical Research Institute. So that's the national organization in Kenya mandated to conduct research on behalf of the Ministry of Health. And this is a collaborative program between Kemri, the Wellcome Trust and Oxford University. Um, a large programme, over 750 staff altogether, and over 100 international collaborations. The pictures here are just to kind of give you a bit of a flavour of quite high-tech laboratories, a very well-resourced building, a centre that's situated within the District General Hospital, which is what this picture at the bottom left shows here, um, but working largely within a fairly rural, low-income setting. And the next set of pictures are, are just to give you um, a flavour of that again, the, the, the context and a little bit of the diversity that we're looking at here within that context of um, largely rural, but within Khalifi town, not only the research centre as quite a well-developed and resourced institution, but we also over the last few years have um, a public university, Pwani University, based in Khalifi as well. So this is quite a mixed, quite a diverse setting. Let me move on then to um, the rationale for public health research data sharing and a little bit of what's in the literature around the reasons why you might want to do that and some of the challenges in doing it. Um, I guess we're all aware, particularly those of us who are involved in public health research and are generating data, that we are um, under in increased pressure to share that data with other scientists working in the field. I want to point out here that in this presentation, I'm talking about public health research data and not other types of data like genomics data or, um, or other types. But a lot of these calls, in fact, this trend originated from the success that was achieved in sharing genomics data um, and really sort of set the scene for other sorts of data sharing to be promoted. And so this kind of pressure is coming from science funders, standard setters and consortia um, and publishers too. Um, a couple of illustrations just reminding us what kind of organisations for nature um, requiring that the data sets that support publication should be made publicly available. Um, the trust, of course, many of us know, require a data sharing plan as part of a grant application with a default that we will share. So why? Um, this WH bulletin WHO paper in 2012 summarises it, I think, really nicely, although there's a huge literature. Um, strengthening collaborative and cumulative processes involved in creating scientific knowledge. That's the basis of it, so really promoting science as an enterprise. Promoting new research, enabling testing of new or alternative hypotheses around existing data sets. Increasing transparency, accountability, reliability of research. Um, ensuring that databases are used um, economically, that there's increased financial return when data sets can be repeatedly used without funding new research. There are some arguments that if research is publicly funded, that the data ought to be used in this way to sort of maximise the economic um, benefits of that public funding. And there are also ideas that if we can actually reduce the unnecessary new studies being done, that that would limit 
the burden on participants and ensure the best use of, of their contributions. So some sense of respecting participants in here too. But in fact, what's happened is that researchers have been quite slow to respond to these calls. There's been a lot of reluctance, um, and I want to look at those issues next from the literature. Accepting that there are clear benefits to scientific, scientific utility, the overall problem is this one, that it's sometimes hard to balance what looks like competing interests of different sorts of stakeholders that are involved here. And what I mean by stakeholders is this list. I'm calling the originating researcher the researcher who conducted the primary study and generated the research. The study participants and the primary communities being the communities from which study participants are drawn. Um, other stakeholders, funders, regulators, science publishers, pharmaceutical industry, and the general public. Um, and there's quite a lot of literature pointing to the, the, the complex ways in which the interests can intersect between and across those groups of people. So if we just look at some of the common issues, I think people will be very familiar with this, so I, I won't dwell on it, and we can always come back if people want to ask questions. But for researchers, the kind of issues that are raised in the literature are about how you protect their career development, how you maintain their first rights to publish, for example, since that's a core way in which people actually promote their careers. Um, use of embargoes is generally accepted, but exactly how those should be applied is less clear. Risks that data that's collected will either be unintentionally or intentionally misrepresented by others, um, raising issues of scientific validity um, and also undermining potentially researchers' reputations. Um, the resources needed is a massive kind of issue for many of us um, to get the data in the shape that it could be shared and get it into repositories and so on and manage and follow through on that. Um, and fears amongst some researchers about being exposed, errors in their research being exposed. Um, for primary communities, these sorts of issues, how are you going to maintain privacy? Um, is it really possible to prevent harms such as stigmatisation? Um, and autonomy risks, that is the extent to which people have control over the way that the data is used and how you could possibly do that when the uses of this data in future couldn't be known at the point at which the data is collected. So this pushes people towards the idea of broad consent, that is that individuals who are participating in studies would give consent in a kind of broad way for their data to be used, either for unspecified purposes or applying some kinds of limits around that. But is that an acceptable way forwards? And so underpinning all of that is the issue of public trust and whether, in the end, um, people are going to have confidence in the way that researchers are operating. And there are, an, there are an extra set of issues in the literature around international research, where data that's generated from low- to middle-income countries might be taken up and used in better-resourced settings. And this is much to do with a kind of lack recognition of the lack of a, a level playing field that researchers who are in better-resourced settings may often be able to more quickly analyze and publish data, whereas the data is um, often being produced in this instance by less well-resourced -res researchers working in, in low or middle-income settings who don't quite have those advantages in, a, in, in all situations. Um, so the, in, the, in the literature, there is a, a quite strong calls for funders to invest in giving scientists in low to middle-income countries skills to do the primary analysis themselves more quickly, um, and also claims that secondary users and funders ought to contribute, collaborating with primary researchers, learning about the data sets they're working with and passing on analysis skills. So this is there in the literature specifically for the kind of setting in which we work in Kenya. Um, just to comment that, you know, the data protection acts in those countries come at this in rather a different way, and it's quite interesting to look at that too. In Kenya, we don't have um, an act yet through Parliament. This is still a draft, a draft act, but um, we can come back to that. I'm not going to dwell on it. I just wanted to flag that that's another way of looking at people's rights in relation to how their data is used. So let me turn to the Kenya study. Um, this is, a, a, as I mentioned at the outset... Um, a collaborative project, um, public health research data sharing project that 
involve these partners. So in addition to ourselves in Kenya, um, two of the um, Oxford, other Oxford Tropical Network sites in Thailand and Vietnam, and also the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, and Sneha, which is an NGO that's operating in um, the slums in Mumbai in India. Um, this is a multi-country study that was funded by the Wellcome Trust and um, a grouping called the Public Health Research Data Forum. Um, and the idea here is that there's very little empirical work conducted in these kinds of settings that might inform what looks like responsive policies on sharing public health research data in these settings. And this project was set up to answer that challenge. So what I'm going to talk about now is just to do with a study in Kenya. So in Kilifi, well in fact in all the sites this is qualitative research, but in Kilifi we undertook um, qualitative research set up as a kind of stakeholder consultation to explain and explore in depth what was going on in data sharing and people's views on that on the basis of having a reasonable understanding of what was entailed in data sharing. We involved a total of about 60 people and the people who were involved were sampled purposively, in other words, to in, in our case, in our um, case, to, to increase diversity in terms of experience. So these photographs are to illustrate the types of groups of people who are involved in the study. Um, top left scientists in the programme, top right community members who live within the um, area in which the study, the research programme operates, which is actually the catchment area for the District General Hospital. Um, these particular individuals are community representatives who are elected by their own communities um, to um, strengthen our community engagement activities. And again, I can talk more about it later. I just don't want to get into methodology in too much detail at this point. But um, I think we can take reasonably typical community members. On the bottom left, this group are opinion leaders within the community, so administrative leaders of various sort or... Um, leaders of different community-based organisations, that kind of thing. And on the bottom right, these are frontline staff. So the field workers who work within the programme, who are often the people who undertake informed consent processes, and community facilitators who work out that interface. The methods. These groups of people obviously fall into groups that are some are slightly more research experienced and some have less experience of research. For those with more research experience, researchers, health providers, and some of the community facilitators, um, those were generally speaking in-depth interviews lasting about an hour. For the less research experienced groups, these were small group discussions lasting the whole afternoon, basically four hours of discussion sharing information on what was going on using various case um, studies and visual aids and so on. I'll show you one in a moment just to give you a flavour of what those conversations were like. So aiming for discussion and debate, prompting reflection around the ethically important issues here. Um, so for example, in a group of six community members, we might have a discussion like this. We used as a case study for many of the community groups the um, integrated database that exists within the programme between the demographic surveillance system and the clinical surveillance system. So clinical surveillance from within the hospital and demographic surveillance within an area of a quarter of a million people living around the district hospital. And that exists as an integrated database within the programme and, as you can imagine, is a, an incredibly important platform for lots of different types of epidemiological research. And it's actually the database for which we most commonly get requests for sharing data. So we use this as our case study. So this would start off a discussion. Most community members, of course, are included in that demographic surveillance. So they would have some understanding of what was going on here. So we started from this point of imagining a field worker coming to the home to collect data. The data being collected and taken back to the research centre, that data being entered into computers. If a child is admitted to the ward, the data from that admission being merged together with the census data and being used to support the Ministry of Health in supporting planning policies and so on locally, and also researchers in the programme in Kilifi in conducting their research. So this is the basic scenario. What do we do? We would then ask if somebody outside Khalifi, researchers outside Khalifi, were interested in accessing that data. Is that reasonable, not reasonable, and what could be done to make it reasonable? 
And what about if it was somebody from right outside of Kenya, other parts of Africa or other parts of the world? So this would be the kind of way in which we would set those discussions up. Um, not to show you anything in detail here, but this was the participants in total. I just wanted you to notice that over half of those participants are actually community stakeholders. Okay, so if I move on to the um, findings. Um, broadly, this slide sort of summarizes it all. Um, across all the groups, um, people supported the potential benefits of sharing research data. But this was always a conditional kind of support. Community stakeholders are more cautious, and many researchers were very strongly positive. But what we saw was that people's, um, the, the degree of caution that people expressed was related to their level of understanding <coughs> of the issues at stake here, what you might gain by sharing data, and what are the ways in which data sharing might normally be governed. Um, and so the low awareness and understanding about, amongst many community stakeholders was often the reason for cautions, but I would want to emphasize that those cautions persisted. Even once people understood how this might happen and what was involved, we still have conditions left here, which is what I want to run through. And these conditions fall into these three broad areas, conditions around how you would balance the benefits and burdens or harms for participants, communities, and researchers, what they are and how you would balance them, the autonomy risks that I mentioned at the beginning, and this kind of overarching issue about there being so many inherent uncertainties about the way that this data might be used, that it's really important that we have some kind of mechanisms for data, sharing data that are trust building for the community. Um, and that holds even if we think that the risks are relatively low, we still need to maintain trust and we still need to be able to show ways in which, as an institution, we're promoting that. Um, so let me talk over the next few slides about benefits. Um, these were the benefits that were seen by all stakeholders for participants and primary communities, not the benefits that were seen by participants. So accepting that there may be reductions in the burden of participation, but the key issue is the second bullet, really, that a strong sense that there ought to be near or long-term transitional health benefits. That means that new studies that might be conducted with the data should lead to improved health interventions and policies that would be relevant to the, a community like this. Um, and this was really quite a critical condition for data sharing from the community um, on more discussion would lead towards at least those sorts of requests being prioritized. And what it highlights is the need for researchers to work in very close partnership with the Ministry of Health in these settings in order to support this kind of translation. Um, in relation to harms, um, again seen by all stakeholders, four participants in the primary community, these three sort of interrelated issues about loss of confidentiality, which are seen as both a harm in itself as well as potentially leading to other sorts of harms, Risks of stigmatization for individuals, but very particularly of groups, when we're dealing with anonymized individual information. It's much less easy to anonymize group information. Um, issues around sensitivity, which were seen to depend not just on the nature of the data, but on the way that it was used. Again, creating a few problems in terms of trying to identify data sets that we could freely share without understanding how it might be used. But overall, these were the kinds of data that people thought were likely to be sensitive, um, perhaps not really very surprising. This general fear about misuse, in terms of the stories that community members were given, this was often linked to local stories of exploitation, um, inappropriate use of traditional medicine knowledge, that kind of thing that gave rise to some of these general fears of what might, about what might happen. So in the next couple of slides, just to give you a flavor, um, some quotes. This is a field worker talking about confidentiality and risks of stigmatization for groups. The information sometimes stigmatizes some communities. Like there was once a cholera outbreak in a certain place and I heard some public health technicians saying people from that place are not clean. So if you come from that place, you feel bad. This is an example of data that we think is relatively neutral, but doesn't feel like that, depending on how it's used. And about the importance of balancing, then, these benefits and burdens. This is a researcher speaking. 
If you're a bit short on benefits, then you tend to focus on risks. If we took more proactive steps to ensure the benefits, I think we would have an easier time weighing these. OK, so let's turn to benefits and burdens or harms for researchers. Um, this is primarily about burdens and harms. Benefits, people accepted that the primary benefit is to science. So potential risks undermining career development. Um, I talked about that in relation to the literature. But very strong ideas coming out here that this ought to be, data sharing ought to be seen as a positive activity and somehow not as a threat to the integrity of the research team who originated, who, who um, uh, generated the original data set. Um, many concerns about potential misuse of data, especially unintentional misuse of data through not adequately understanding. Um, and as mentioned in the literature, uh, concerns about resources. And so because of these kind of concerns um, for researchers, these were the sort of emerging points that people felt were important, that scientific collaborations would be a really positive way forwards for many researchers working in our kind of setting, ideal if used as far as possible. Um, the point that it would support scientific validity, because the originating researchers understand the data and how it was collected, um, it would allow leveraging of scientific capacity building within that collaboration, increase the opportunities to protect and promote interests for the community, and be a trust-building kind of exercise both for the community and for researchers. So um, a couple of quotes on this. This is a community liaison offer speaking. Sharing of data should just be clearly seen as a productive way of getting new knowledge, but not hammering, or not saying that your methods are not working, or maybe not degrading. It should be emphasised that it's a healthy activity. And a senior researcher, I prefer that there be a convention of practice about utilising data, some sort of cooperative forum in which people can come in and say, I'd like to use this piece of data, I know you've collected it, I've got this really good idea, could we do something together? So this was the feeling that was coming out, recognising that this might not be possible in all instances. So what we're looking at here in terms of the balance of interests that I kind of framed right at the beginning um, is in many of these narratives from both the community and researchers, it was about promoting rather than just protecting interests in recognition of this lack of a, of a level playing field between researchers who are working in less well and more well resourced settings. So for researchers, obviously embargoes, where possible scientific collaborations, and the capacity building requirement for researchers who are working in um, lower resource settings when needed. For primary communities, thinking about the structural inequities that already exist and not sharing data in such a way that might actually increase those inequities. So promoting near and long-term translational benefits through the Ministry of Health partnerships and considering the adequacy of the benefit sharing arrangements in the primary research that generated the data in the first place. So I'm, I'm not going to read this one out. I'm going to give you a minute to read through it. This is a senior researcher. It seems rather long, but I think it's really relevant. OK, so um, moving on to autonomy and consent. Um, the conversations that we had here were not about what kind of consent might be needed for data that's been archived in the past. We were talking about collecting data now and moving forwards. Um, and across all groups, um, there was support for the idea that people should understand and agree to the fact that their data might be shared in future. And I'm talking about anonymized data here, obviously. Um, there was agreement that that would be um, a fair way to share data so long as it was linked to a fair decision-making process in the future about how data could be accessed. Um, people should understand that data may be shared and have the ability to opt out if they don't want that. Um, that and again, I'd like you to remember that I'm talking about findings from researchers as well as community members. This is, this is claims on both sides. So that broad consent looks as though it might be an acceptable compromise if there are fair governance mechanisms in place. Um, but this is a compromise 
This is because within the community discussions, um, people talked through and saw the kinds of problems there might be if we were to take a different sort of an approach. So if we're not to use broad consent, then we must use one of those tiered forms of consent where people give permission for their data to be shared in and used in certain sorts of ways, um, or we have to re-consent, go back and ask people each time if their data can now be used for another study that's come along. And both of those were seen by all stakeholders to be extremely challenging. And so the idea was that broad consent would be acceptable as long as linked to a fair decision-making process. Um, some quotations again to give you some flavour. This is a, a case here as a Kenry community representative. I must know that my information will be shared for it to be used in research, but there are others who won't agree. So according to me, it's good to be informed so that if you don't want, you will indicate it right there in the form. And here's a community facilitator speaking. You might assume that this one is just a community member. He will have no way of seeing this data again. But he might come across that information, then he'll come to us saying, OK, is this what you're doing? Now he'll tell you, this is the end of me giving any information when you come to my place, and you know he can spread that. So we're really talking about trust and maintaining trust. So that takes me to the last big topic about fair governance and trust. I mentioned already that a lot of these issues arise because of the uncertainty that's inherent in these forms of data sharing. Who's going to ask for what data when and to do what um, are things that we don't know at the point of collecting the data. Um, Emphasising the importance of having institutional trust building types of policies. Um, and there is luckily a whole literature on this kind of area. We know what sorts of things will generally speaking promote trust in institutions. And they're things like this. Engagement and dialogue with citizens and governance processes that include openness, solidarity, fairness, and truth-telling. But even with those kind of governance systems in place, we have to accept that we can't always control the way that the data is used. And I put this quotation in to give you an idea of how somebody within the community looked at this, talking about governance and lack of control. For instance, if anyone gives me his shirt now, after that, even tomorrow, if he sees the shirt is dirty because I don't wash it, he cannot say anything. Now it belongs to me, I can also give it to someone else. So I'm saying that when we agree, that means you're in agreement with whatever the other person is going to do. So it's just really highlighting the, the, the sense that people have of uncertainty and the importance of trust. So these institutional trust building mechanisms that come out of this consultation um, are these types of areas, that there should be individual awareness and agreement tied into the opportunity to opt out if people don't want to do that. There should be community involvement, which I'll come back to just talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, governance processes um, should support these principles of independence and accountability. And by accountability, I think a really important part of this is community accountability. And the governance processes that I'm referring to here are both in terms of how we develop the policy in the first place and also about how decisions are made. So we might think the one which is about how we develop the policy in the first place, this project is quite a good example of community involvement in developing policy, showing that it is feasible, if challenging. Um, and the fourth around scientific collaborations being encouraged and promoted where possible. So coming back to the community involvement, it, from this consultation that we undertook, it's really quite difficult to reach any secure conclusions about a good way forwards. But what was absolutely clear was a sense that community members shouldn't be excluded from data sharing processes. And these were the kind of ideas that were raised and for which or around which we think there needs to be more research. Um, the idea that we um, message better at a broad scale about data sharing as a component of research. So that when we're engaging communities, and talking about research in general, that part of our messaging ought to also talk about its usefulness in terms of supporting future research through the data that's collected. The idea that you might involve community members in policy development, as done here, and the idea that you might involve community members in access decisions. Um, we could talk more about that, but we don't really have a very firm conclusion around those areas, but there, there are ways in which you might think about this. So my last couple of slides are just on summing up what we've learned from this exercise. Um, community involvement in developing data sharing policy is 
essential, feasible and challenging. It has resource requirements and it needs more research. Um, if you remember, I, I mentioned this was part of a, um, an international collaborative project. So at least we've got those six sites who have all done similar kind of work. Um, and um, that work is being published in the Journal for Empirical Health, Journal for Empirical Research in Human Research Ethics. I'll give you the um, reference a little bit later. Um, the second point is about balancing benefits and burdens and how that can be done. And this idea that we shouldn't just be trying to think of protecting interests, but in this situation of sharing data between that's collected in low resource settings and shared with high resource settings, that we also need to be thinking about promoting interests so that we don't actually widen existing global inequities. Um, and for that, we have the key role of Ministry of Health Partnerships for researchers and this idea that scientific capacity building and scientific collaborations is a really important way forward. Um, from our work, at least in Kilifi, it seems as though broad consent processes are likely to be acceptable when they're linked to opt-out um, possibilities and fair processes of governance. The inherent uncertainties mean that trust building mechanisms are really important at institutional level. And just again, that this kind of trust that we're speaking about here um, is important regardless of actual levels of risk. And the reasons that it's important are around supporting scientific validity, sustainability of research, and respectful forms of community involvement. Um, so fair governance then, balancing here, promoting science, and also promoting local stakeholder interests. I don't mean balancing those two against each other, but each of those needs to be thought about carefully. And these features of independence and accountability, including to the community. Um, other settings, um, clearly this, is, this type of work, this type of empirical work is very context dependent. And so we would not reach to um, transfer these findings automatically to other settings. And it is important for more research to be done in this area, but involving different types of settings. Um, and then just the last point, I think a really useful way of thinking about this that crops in, up in the literature is considering, research is considering their social license in relation to sharing public health research data. Um, so just letting you know that this year, the Nuffield Council on Bioethics um, published a report on the collection, linking and use of data in biomedical research and healthcare, um, which we were happy to see because actually we have a lot of similar issues in our consultation to the ones that were um, put forward by the expert working group for that report. Um, a little bit of self-advertisement that we've got two publications in press from this work in Kenya. Um, the Journal of Empirical Research and Human Research Ethics is a special edition that will bring together all of those um, case studies from all the sites um, and we've also got an in-press publication um, with PLOS One, which is looking more specifically at trust and social relations. So thank you very much.